Let's start with Al Fatiha. Everybody recite with me together. Audhu Billahi min al Shaitan al Rajim. Bismillah al Rahman al Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Al Rahman al Rahim. Malik Yawm al Din. Iyaka Nabud wa Iyaka Nasta'in. اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين 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 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Today inshallah I wanted to talk to you guys about the story of the three prophets mentioned in Surah Yasin As you know Surah Yasin our Prophet Sallallahu told us, I wish everyone in my Ummah would memorize Yaseen. This was one of the, the hopes of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Surah Yaseen is which number in the Quran? Out of 114, which surah is it? 36th 36 surah. And there's a hadith, it's, it's not rigorously authenticated, but it's been accepted by a lot of the scholars, in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, everything has a heart. And the heart of the Qur'an is Yasin. Yasin. So Surah Yasin holds a lot of, a lot of uh, blessings in it, a lot of secrets in it, a lot of great, great gifts from Allah in it. And the Prophet Wasallam, he was being given Surah Yasin when he was going through great hardships. People were rejecting him, people were turning against him, people were plotting against him. And when all these things were being said and done, outwardly, the public were rejecting the message of Muhammad ﷺ. And he was dealing with his people for years. And it looked like their animosity levels were going up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Yaseen, telling the Prophet ﷺ, أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يؤمنون. Majority of them, they're not believers. However, there are some people secretly, they're doing what? They're coming to Iman. But because of the situation outside, everybody hates Muslims. The ones that are actually accepting Islam, they're hiding their Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ is being told, you keep doing what you're doing. You keep calling people to Allah. You may not think it's working, but something's changing in the hearts. There are people hidden in their homes, and they are calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bil ghaib, while they're hidden. No one else sees them. Allah knows they exist. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu a story about other prophets that went behind him, before him. Because one of the accusations against the Prophet sallallahu was, you've gone mad. You know, suddenly you come to us with this message that there is no God except Allah. People start saying to the Prophet sallallahu things like, you've gone crazy. Like, you, you, you know, you used to be normal, what happened to you? So all these things are happening. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Everything okay? Okay, pay, pay attention. Pay attention. The Prophet ﷺ is being told, إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ No doubt about it, you are amongst those who have been sent. And being from amongst those who have been sent means what? Is he the only one who was sent? Or were there other people like the Prophet ﷺ that came before? There were others. So the Prophet ﷺ is being told, you're walking on a path, you're chosen, you've been given a life that others walked this path before you. And what happened to them? Now the story of three people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا أَصْحَابَ الْقَرْيَةِ إِذْ جَاءَهَ الْمُرْسَلُونَ Tell them the story of the people to whom two messengers came. Not one, how many? Two messengers. So imagine two messengers came to speak to one qarya, not big city. A qarya is a small village. So the small village got two messengers, two people receive revelation at the same time. They come, come out and they start inviting people to Allah at the same time. And all of their message was the same. They all came out to the people and said, O oh people, there is no God except Allah. Now that has profound implications. Because everybody has something that's important to them, yes? Like if you're five years old, you probably like... Uh, gum and candies and things like this. If you're 10 years old, what's the most important thing to you? Toys. Toys yeah. 15 years old, probably PlayStation system. Uh, 20 years old, probably your car. 
25 years old, probably your fiance, 30 years old, probably your children, 40 years old, probably your house, your job, your career. So depending on what age you're in, there is something that's very important for you. Every one of us have something that's very important. I can tell you, no, without a doubt, if you have a phone and you're a teenager, this is probably the most important thing in your life. True or not? Yeah, so, so if you're older, it's probably your job, your career, so your education. So people's focus go on to different things. And the prophets were sent to tell people, look, all these things are fine and dandy. You can enjoy them, but do not worship anything except Allah. Your main focus, your main attention should be for Allah. So if you use your phone, you use it for Allah. If you play video games, you play it for Allah. If you have friendships, you make friends, your friendship should be for Allah, right? If your friends are telling you to do drugs, is it for Allah? No, right? If your friends are telling you to hurt yourself, is it for Allah? No, right? So everything that you do then, if it's for Allah, then your worship is for Allah. But if it's taking you away from Allah, then that thing becomes more important to you than Allah. Now it's a very dangerous situation to be in. So these people, they had idols. They had their own temples. They had their own statues and all these things. For them, they had an outward manifestation of shirk. They thought there were some spirits that were all powerful. One of them would give them money. One of them would make them fall in love. One of them would make them safe from calamities. So they have these different spirits and they make statues thinking the spirit of that God or whatever it is lives in that statue. So they would have rituals around them, like Hinduism today, right? They have similar things. Uh, so they'd have rituals around them, they had all these different things. And what they did without realizing is they cut themselves off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead, they're now bowing down and worshiping statues made of rock and stone and wood. So the prophets came to them and said, Look, all these things, they're fake. They're not going to help you with anything. The only one that can help you is Allah who created the heavens and the earth. If you look up in the night sky, you see the stars. Do you know how far away these stars are? Do you know how many planets Allah has created? Do you see how vast this creation is? Do you know how Allah brings rain down from the sky? How He splits the seeds open? How vegetation grows out of the ground? How Allah is doing all these things to you, providing you food and water? Are you going to go bow down to a statue? What are you doing? Right? So these messengers start talking to people. Now, if you really love something, I mean, you really love something. Like, for example, a, a young child plays Minecraft or Fortnite all day, all night. And if the parents say, I'm going to take away your computer because you're playing Fortnite all the time, is he going to be happy about that? No, right? Have you seen those YouTube videos of the reactions? Parents come turn up the computer, and then the kid starts throwing a tantrum, controllers flying across the room, they're shouting at the top of their lungs, right? So when somebody comes and tries to take away something that's beloved to you, something that's dear to you, what happens? Your natural reaction. You get defensive. You say, no, I'm not giving up my, my phone. I'm not giving, if I tell you, turn off your phone, will you do it? Yes or no? Okay, alhamdulillah. That means the halaqa and the meeting for Allah is more important than the phone, right? So when something else becomes more beloved to them than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have a natural reaction that says, no, you're wrong. We don't have to follow you. We don't have to listen to you. So they start rejecting the messengers. Not one messenger, two messengers. And they're inviting them to Allah, telling them the truth. Logically, it makes sense to them. But inside, they don't want to let go of their culture. This is the way we've been brought up. My grandfather used to sit in front of this statue, worshipping this statue. My great-grandfather used to sit here. You're telling me they were wrong? I love my grandfather. I'm not going to say he was wrong. right? So they start fighting against the messengers and said, No, no, no. This is not true. You guys are liars. Not much time had passed. Another person came out. Allah says, فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثٍ A third person came and said, Oh people, Yesterday an angel came to me. I know it sounds crazy, but last night, Jibrail, angel descended upon me. And he told me, these two messengers, they're telling you the truth. And I'm one of them now. 
And I'm telling you, all these things you're worshiping, they don't, they don't, they're, they're not deserving of your attention the way you're giving attention to them. The one who really deserves your attention is Allah. Because when you die and you leave this world, you're not going to take your phones with you. You're not going to take your idols with you. You're not going to take your stock accounts with you. You're not going to take your video games with you. When you die and you go to the grave, you're going to meet Allah and you're not going to have anything else. It will be just you and your creator. And if you live the life for his sake, he's going to give you life better than this. But if you forgot about him, what's going to happen? Terrible things are going to happen. So as they're giving this message, as they're inviting people, these people, they came up with a way to refute them. They said, قَالُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُنَا Wait a second. You're telling us angels came down and talked to you? You're telling us that you got this message that says there's no other God except Allah? And you're telling me some angels came and sent, gave you this message? Uh, you're just human being like us. You eat food, you go to the bathroom. Why should we listen to you? That's their first argument. They don't want to listen to the prophets because why? They're human beings too. So their first argument was, we will not listen to you because you're human beings. Okay? They'd rather listen to deaf and dumb blind statues. But second argument they made, And you're telling me God sends revelation? You're telling me there's something called wahi? Allah gives his message to people? Allah doesn't do that. Rahman doesn't do that. And what's interesting is, they started using the name of Allah, Rahman. Rahman means what? The merciful. the merciful. And they're saying the merciful doesn't send revelation. We're going to talk about that in a second. But they're kind of contradicting themselves by saying that. And then the third thing they said, in antum illa takribun. In fact, you guys are liars. Now, mind you, before they, these people became messengers, they were known in their communities as honest people. Just like Muhammad ﷺ was known in his community as what? As an honest person. His, his nickname was Sadiq and Amin. Sadiq means what? Truthful. The truthful one. Amin means? Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Right? So they came up with these three arguments. First, uh, you guys are human beings. Second, Allah doesn't send revelation. Third, you're liars. So our ulama, they said... What's interesting is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down angels as messengers, like imagine, I'm a human being, right? I'm giving you a talk about Allah and His messenger. If I suddenly grew out wings from my back, right? And I start talking to you and ooh, light start coming out of my eyes and my head, everything is shining. And I tell you to pray five times a day, do this, do that. You think, you think it's doable? If I tell you, I'm doing it all the time, you should be able to do it too. You're going to be like, well, wait a second. You got all this wing stuff, you got light coming off of you. You're not human. And you're telling us to do things that angels do. We can't be angels, we're what? Humans. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows if Allah sends angels to give us the message, what's going to happen? You're going to say, why should we listen to you? You're angels. We can't follow you because you're not a human being. We are human beings. You don't even know what being a human is like. So Allah chooses messengers to be what? Human beings. Someone who lives the message, who shows us how to be a, per a person who's in a state of submission to Allah. And then they call others. And then when you look at them, you say, well, if he can do it, what? I can do it. He's a human being. I'm a human being. But their thing was, why should we obey a human being? So... Question, your parents are human beings? Yes. Mm -hmm. Your teachers are human beings? Yes. The police officer on the street is a human being? Why should we listen to them? If the police officer tells you to stop, do you listen? Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> it's the law. The police officer has something, has been given something. What has the police officer been given? Authority, yes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already in the design of the human creation has placed this concept of authority. Parents have been given authority over their children. They can tell you, eat this, this is good for you. Don't eat this, this is bad for you. And we learned that growing up, that I have to listen to my, children, my parents, right? 
Teachers have been given authority over their students. Government officials have been given authority over their subjects. This is how human beings operate. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his message to messengers, he takes those messengers and makes them authority to be followed and to be obeyed. Why should we listen to you? Because Allah gave them authority. Allah made them messengers. They're not speaking on their own behalf. About Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَىٰ Prophet Muhammad, he doesn't tell you things because of something he desires or because of something he wants. He tells you because Allah commanded him to say these things. So if a human being follows his own desires and tells you to do something, that's, that's a different story. But if they're being commanded to say something by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what's, what's the, the situation here? They have to be obeyed. They have to be obeyed. So first thing they said, why should we listen to you, you're human beings? And the reality is, that's how it's supposed to be. Second thing they said, Ar-Rahman, the one who's most merciful, does not send wahi, does not send revelation. So basically what they're saying is, this message, you're making it up. It's not from Allah. And their claim against Allah is, Allah doesn't guide people. If Allah is merciful, isn't it part of His mercy that He guides people? Think about it for a second. If, if, if a father or mother loves their children, and they really, really love their children, and you are the child, and you're running and putting your hand in the stove to get a cake, right? It's really hot, it's not cooled down yet. You try to get the cake, and you stick your hand in the stove while it's burning hot. Are they gonna shout at you? <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Yes. yes or no? Yes. yes. They're shouting at you, is it out of mercy or is it out of anger? Mercy. It's mercy, right? Now, if they didn't say anything, okay, I am not going to say anything. Does that mean they're merciful or no? If, if you see a blind man walking to a ditch and you can see and you don't say anything, that means you don't care. That means you have no mercy in your heart, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're calling him a rahman the merciful. And then they're saying he doesn't do what? He doesn't guide. So which is a contradiction. They're contradicting themselves. So the fact that Allah is Ar-Rahman means Allah is always sending what? Mercy. mercy. His guidance. His messengers. They're always sending. Like this gathering, for example. This is from Allah's mercy. A lot of people didn't make it. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose you to be here so you can remember Allah. That means Allah has chosen you to be part of the guidance, to receive this guidance. And He says in the Quran, Whoever Allah guides, they are guided. Whoever Allah leaves astray, nobody can guide them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being a Rahman, He sent us guidance. And so He left it up to us now. You want to take the guidance or not? It's your choice. And then the third thing they said is, In antum illa takribun. You guys are liars. Now, if I lie to you about small things, is it likely that I'm going to lie to you about big things? Yeah. Yes. If I don't lie to you about small things, is it likely that I'm going to lie to you about big things? Yeah. If I'm not even going to lie to you about something small, like tiny thing, am I going to then go and lie to you about Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth? No. So somebody who doesn't lie about small things means they care about the truth, right? And if they care about the truth, the ultimate truth is what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of his names is Al-Haq. He is the ultimate truth. So if they're not even lying about the small things and they respect the truth so much that they, they adhere to it even in the minor things, when it comes to major things like the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're not going to lie to you. Right? There has been cases of liars try to pretend to be prophets. There was a guy named Musaylama. He saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when he was, you know, when he became a prophet, he announced the, the message of Islam, people start following him. And after the persecution in Mecca, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came to Medina, and now he has a whole city. The city was called Medina to Nabi. Musaylima thought, this is a good career path. Maybe I should become a prophet too, and create my own followers, and I can have them give me money and I can have them do this and have them do that. So he thought the Prophet ﷺ is faking it. 
And he started faking being a prophet. And he was a liar. He started coming up with weird recitations like Al-Fil, Malfil, Khurtum al tawil Like, what is the elephant has a long nose and a short tail, right? And he started coming up with these rhymes and saying, this is my Quran. And people started following him. And then he wrote a letter to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, from Musaylama Rasulullah to Muhammad Rasulullah. Nisful ard li wa nisful ard lak. Half the earth is mine and half the earth is yours. In other words, you got your territory, I got my territory. Let's respect each other's boundaries. Now he's a liar, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. The messenger of Allah. And many people saw signs of this. For example, in the battle of uh, Uhud. One Sahabi got his eye popped out. Somebody smacked him with a sword, his eyeball came out. And he's got his eyeball in his hand, and he ran to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Ya Rasulullah, <laughs> you know, he's like hurt, he's in pain. Prophet ﷺ grabbed it, put it back, and he did, said some prayers, and he wiped his hand over the guy's eye. He can see, clearly. And he said the eye that was damaged was able to see better than the eye that was not damaged. So somebody else heard about this who was blind in one eye. They went to Musaylima. They said, Musaylima, I heard that, that the other prophet, you know, somebody went blind in one eye and he made dua for them and came back. Can you do the same thing for me? He said, sure, of course. And he spit in his hand and he wiped it over the guy's eyes and he said, may Allah make your eye like the other one. The guy went full blind. <laughs> so Allah was showing them signs that this is the real messenger. This guy is a liar. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he received this letter, this guy is all about materialism. Half the earth is yours, half the earth is mine. Prophet Sallallahu said, from Muhammad, messenger of Allah, to Musaylama al-Kazzab, the liar. As for the earth, it belongs to Allah, and he gives it to whoever he wants. Right? You, it's not up to you and me to distribute the earth. What are you talking about? So, basically, uh, these messengers now, three of them, they're calling people to Allah day in and day night. Daytime and nighttime, publicly and secretly. What's going on with them? Are people responding to them? Yeah. No. Instead, their animosity start going up. Now, imagine Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reading this story in Surah Yasin. He's calling people to Islam. People's animosity is going up. He doesn't see people accepting Islam. But Allah says, you know, إنما, إنما, except those who, who have khashya of Allah in the ghaib. You know, فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ Except those who have taqwa of Allah and they're starting to think about Allah and the Messenger and the hereafter in the secret, give them glad tidings of great forgiveness from Allah, right? So the Prophet is reading about this. Now he's reading, I'm alone. There were three people and they went through the same thing. The people start accusing them and abusing them. And finally, it came to a point, the people said to them, إِنَّا تَطَيِّرْنَا بِكُمْ Oh, you people, messengers, we think you guys are bad omen. Like, you know, when, when somebody has like, what they call a uh, jinx on them or something like they're just bad luck. When they go to like anywhere, bad things starts happening around them. So the people start coming up with these superstitious thoughts. They said, don't listen to those messengers. They are bad luck. Probably get those text messages. If you don't forward this to seven people, you'll have seven years of bad luck, something like that, right? So... They start saying things like this. That if you talk to these messengers, you're going to have bad luck for seven years. You're, you're not never going to get married. You're not, this is not going to happen to you. That's not, you're going to lose all your money. You're going to lose your job. So they start spreading these kind of rumors about the messengers. Superstitious rumors. Right? And of course, when the messengers try to go out and invite the people, what's the reaction? Ah, don't talk to me. Run away. Right? And the messengers are like, I just said, Salaamu Alaikum. Like, ah, you said, people start talking. So they start running away from them. They start boycotting them. They start, like, people refuse to sell food to them. They're going through a lot of hardship. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reading this. He was boycotted. Right? People start, like, stop trading with them. He was lived in the desert, driven out of his home. So he, he knows what these messengers went through. And then, those messengers, did they give up or no? No. Despite all of that. Now, if you're making it up and you're a liar, and you get a little bit of hardship, you're going to be like, okay, fine, you know what? I tried, it didn't work. Let's be friends again. I'm going to stop talking about it so you can, you know, but 
his messengers, they're working for Allah. Even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when they're persecuting him and you're still calling to people Allah, calling people to Allah, they came and said, look, listen, what do you want? We're, we're trying to figure this out. You want to be rich? We'll make you the richest person in Arabia. You want to have a, a beautiful wife? We'll marry you 10 of the most beautiful women in Arabia. You want to be king? Fine, we will make you our king. But stop talking about this la ilaha illallah stuff. We like to have our idols. We like to keep our culture. Like you're from the Quraysh, we'll, we don't mind making you our king. Muhammad Sallallahu said what? You put the sun in my right hand and put the moon in my left hand, even then I will not stop this message. Because it's not his message to stop. It's Allah's message. If he stops, what happens? Oh man, you think people are bad? You think people can hurt you? You think people can give you a hard time? What about Allah? Have you seen volcanoes? Have you seen earthquakes? Hurricanes? Recently we saw a hurricane. I had a friend who was stuck in a hurricane. He used to work at a power company. And uh, they evacuated the city. They said, hurricane's coming. Everybody went out. And him and his crew, they stayed behind. And they had special bunkers. Because in case the power goes out, they can go out and fix things. So... When he's in the bunker, all these people are crammed in. He said, you know what? I'm going to go home and take a nap. I'm going to set my alarm. The hurricane's not going to be here for about five hours. I'm going to come back in about three hours. He went home. He took a nap, set the alarm clock. The hurricane came earlier. Knocked out the power, so his alarm system went out. And he said he woke up, and it was pitch dark. And he could hear things crashing, breaking, glass shattering. And all these, like, Massive sound. And he said he couldn't see in front of his hand. And it was daylight. It was so dark he couldn't see his fingers when he put up his hand like this. And he said he could hear, like, you know how bullets when they sound? When they hit the walls? This is what it sounded like. Everything is crashing into the walls. He said first reaction he had, he ran to the door. He was going to go to his car to go back to the bunker. But he heard what's happening outside. The door is getting things slamming against the door. He said, if I open that door, I'm going to die. So he went and, and he went inside the bathtub and he's just crouching down. His friends noticed he's missing. They got into this special uh, car that, that could withstand this and they drove into his house, like literally into the house. And they're like, Sonny, are you there? They found him and they rescued him. He said, that day I realized the power of Mother Nature. Now Mother Nature, who's Mother Nature? Allah, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Mother Nature. Imagine... What Allah can do to a person when they go against the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those messengers, they know there is a place called hellfire. There is a place, you know, when Allah takes people to account, oh my God, you don't want to be that person. So they said, you know, put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand. I don't care. You make me king, make me the richest person, marry me the most beautiful woman. I'm not going to stop because this message is from Allah. Right? And these messengers, the three of them, this is what they did. They said, we're not going to stop. And people are boycotting them, giving them hard time. Finally, they said, uh, you know, they said, your, your, you know, your bad you know, luck is with you. It's your bad luck that you're not listening to us. We're bringing you good message. This message of Islam is for your protection. It's for your goodness. Like you're, nobody else is going to benefit by praying except you. Nobody else is going to benefit by, by being a good person except you. This is for your own good. It's your bad luck that you're not listening. They said, They said, okay, messengers, we've had it. Enough. If you guys don't be quiet and you don't stop talking to us about Allah and his messengers and all this stuff and the day of judgment, they said, we're going to tie you up and we're going to stone you guys to death. Now they're threatening violence. Right? They cannot argue with them. So they come up with superstitious things to defend themselves. But even after that, when they realize they keep losing the debates, they keep losing the arguments, they said what? We're going to kill you. We're going to tie you up and throw stones at you. When you get to the level of arguments, reaching the level of violence, whoever initiates violence, they're admitting defeat. For example, a little man says, two plus two is four. The big bully says, no, two plus two is five. <laughs> the little man says, two plus two is four. I can prove it to you. See, two and two, put it together, it's four. The big man says, 
I said it's five. Who in the argument? The bully says, okay, fine, it's five, right? He doesn't want to get beat up. But in reality, the moment somebody reaches to violence means what? They have nothing else left. They've exhausted everything else. Their logic failed. Their arguments failed. Their, 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 everything failed. means they have been proven they're wrong. And the only way they can still impose their will is by what? Violence. So they said, we're going to kill you. We're going to stone you to death. And the messengers that they stop or no? No, because those messengers, they know we're not afraid of anyone except Allah. What are you going to do to me? Kill me? If you kill me, I'm just going to go to Allah. You're going you're gonna to drive me out of the city? I'll just make dhikr. Right? You're going to lock me up? I'll just sit there and contemplate and, and, and reflect on, on, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes. Like whatever you do to me, you cannot take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala away from me. So the maximum harm they can do is kill you. But the moment they kill you, what happens? They go to Allah. They go to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, this life is very short. Right? The longest life that people live here, when you compare it to the infinite life that Allah promised us in the hereafter, what's 200 years compared to infinity? Nothing. Nothing. Right? Somebody lives 1,000 years. What's 1,000 compared to infinity? Mm-hmm. Nothing. Right, so the eternal life is actually the real life. This life is just a short test. So they said, do whatever you want. And they took these messengers. They tied them to stakes. And they were gathering stones. And they're about to stone them. Now remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu Those people are not listening to you. Most of them are disbelievers. But there are what? Secret believers. When they're about to kill these messengers... One person start running. He heard the news, you know, that they're going to kill the messengers from the furthest parts of the next city. So he's not in their qariya, he's not in their town. He's in a different city. He starts running with great effort. He comes running to them. He comes running from the furthest part of the city, running with great effort. And he says, Qala ya qawm, Oh my people! Oh, my people. He's calling out to everybody. Follow those messengers. Don't hurt them. Follow them. Look, they're not asking you for anything. Did they ask you for money? The guy who told you about Allah, did he say, okay, I told you about Allah and Jannah, now give me $500? Is that what happened? They're not doing it for themselves. What are they gaining from this? You tie them up on sticks, you're about to stone them. They're not asking you for any ajr. Think about this. They're not asking you for anything. They're guided. They have been guided by Allah. They have revelation from Allah. They're not making stuff up. They're not here to disturb the peace. They're here to establish something bigger than that. Listen to them. And then he starts giving a speech. And why should I not worship the one who created me and to whom I'm going to return? Like, think about it. Why would you not worship Allah when He's the one who created you and when you die, you're going to go back to Him? Like, why, what, what would make sense for a person not to do that? Like, think about all the blessings that you have. Your clothing, where'd you get it from? Allah. Your health? Your eyesight, your hearing, your heart, your family, your home. Like everything is from him. Why would you not worship him? You know, one of the things about shirk that doesn't make sense is imagine somebody hosts you to their house. They give you everything. Food, drinks, whatever. You enjoy yourself and you, you eat. And, you, and then the guy who is enjoying himself eating the food of the host, he leaves the house, goes to the neighbor and says, thank you very much. That was an awesome party. Does that make sense? So when you when you enjoying the blessings of Allah, you should be thanking who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's saying, Like, why should I not worship the one who created me and I'm going to return to him? If I worship other than him, if I worship other than Allah, if my attention makes anything else more important than Allah, then definitely I have lost my way. Now, this guy was very tactful. 
He has a way of giving a speech. He was not telling them, you people are, have lost your way. Why don't you worship? He didn't say, why don't you worship Allah? You guys have lost your way. You're doing this, you're doing that. He didn't say that. He said, why would I not worship Allah? You know, if I worshiped other than Allah, then I would be lost. So he's giving himself as an example, right? While at the same time giving them advice. And this is, this is a tactful thing that most people, when they call people to Allah, they don't do that. They say, you people are munafiqoon. You know, it's time for prayer. And what are you doing? Still playing video games. That's not how we invite to Allah. Prophet sallallahu he told us, Udu ila sabili rabbik. Invite them to the way of your Lord. Bil mawidatan hasan. Bil hikmah wa mawidatan hasan. With wisdom and beautiful speeches. Talk to them nicely, right? So if you're doing something wrong, if somebody comes to you and says, why, why are you doing that? You shouldn't do that. You're going to like that? Yes or no? No. no. But if they say, hey sister, salam alaikum. I, I really want you to be in Jannah with me. We can have parties there. We can have rivers of, of, of fruit punch, whatever you like. You know, let's, let's pray together. Can you do that? Let's make wudu, pray together. Let's do that, inshallah. We'll go to Jannah together. That's better than, what are you, hypocrite? You're not praying, right? So this guy, he was speaking to them in the most beautiful way. I believe in your God. I believe in your God. Listen to what I'm saying. As he's giving a speech, people are silent. They're listening. They got the prophets tied up. What do you think happened? Were they like, oh, golly, we were wrong. Thank you for telling us. Is that what happened? No. They said, kill him too. So they tied him up next to the prophets. And lo and behold, they started their stoning. What's interesting is the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't talk about them stoning. Allah immediately transitions into the guy realizing he's in Jannah. Like you know in, in the movies, there's like a cutscene. Like one moment you're in this place, you're like talking to somebody, and then boom, like there's a teleportation that happens, and you're like, how am I in Egypt right now? How did this happen, right? Something like that happened. One moment he's talking to those people, and then they're like, kill him, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's shouting angry. One guy picks up a stone, and he hurls it at him, and the stone is moving, and the guy's like, Ugh! And he opens his eyes. He's in front of Jannah. The doors of Jannah are opening up. And he's like, what? How did I get here? That's awesome, right? He's just amazed by what just happened. And then he starts thinking about his people. Ya layta qawmi ya alamun. Oh man, I wish they knew about this. I wish they could see this, you know. And he's still concerned about them. Like, why would you leave your home from outside the city, run all the way here and start telling people these things? And you know they're about to kill other people for telling them the same thing. Why would you do that? Because you have mercy in your heart. Because he had mercy and he cared about those people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him greater mercy. So, He's looking around, he's like, Ya layta qawmi ya alamun. Oh man, I wish my people could see this. I wish my people knew about this. Bima ghafara li rabbi wa ja'alani min al-mukramin. How Allah, he forgave me and made me amongst the honored people. Like He's seeing the blessings come to him. He's seeing angels coming to him, inviting him to the nice uh, barbecue chicken dinner. Like He's enjoying himself. And he's like, man, I could, they could try this. I, I really wanted them to try these oranges and these drinks like... And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but the people that got stayed behind, what happened to them? In kanat illa sayhatan wahidatan, fa'idha hum khamidun. All it took to destroy them was one sound. One sound. Something happened, there was a loud sound in the nature, and boom, all their hearts stopped. Like they thought they were so powerful, they could go against Allah. In reality, if Allah wants to destroy us, what does it take? Nothing. The fact that we're breathing, the fact that we're still going about our days, even though we do sins, we do other things that are wrong, the fact that we still have life is great mercy from Allah. Because any moment, if Allah wanted to destroy the whole universe, is it possible or no? Yeah. The astronomers, they saw a supernova happen in the sky. You know what supernova is? Yeah. A star explodes. 
And when it explodes, all the planets around it get sucked up into the flames. And then all these metal chunks of iron, all these things start hurling everywhere, in every direction. Our ulama said, human beings on the earth is not the first creation. There are other creation before us. And Allah destroyed them. Because they started shedding blood and causing corruption. And so when Allah created Adam alayhi salam, angels said, قَالُوا تَجْعَلُوا فِيهَا مَا يُفْسِدُوا فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُوا الدِّمَا Ya Allah, you're going to put people on the earth, they're going to shed blood and cause corruption. Our scholar said, the angels knew humans are going to do this because they saw the previous creation. And what's interesting is, you know we have iron in the earth? The core of the earth is iron. All the scientists now, they are in unanimous agreement. Iron is not from our solar system. It actually got created in a star that exploded. And its chunks flew and landed on our planet. And then from that, life here became possible. So who knows, right? Who knows what other planets existed, what people lived on those planets, what happened to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation is vast. One of his name is Khalaq. Bala wa huwa Khalaq al-Alim, he says in Surah Yasin. So those people, Allah says, it was just one sound and they got destroyed. And then Allah tells us, what was their mistake? Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. What great calamity, what great regrets on these servants. Right? Allah is now expressing, uh, yeah, I was like, why? Why? Why did they had options to, to live and have a good life? Why did they do this to themselves? You know, we didn't send them messengers except they took it as a joke. We sent them Islam, they took it as a joke. It was not important to them. Why? Why are people playing with their lives like this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is questioning, like, afsos, like, you know, ya hasrata, like, what great calamity is this? So, in other words, now, we're listening to this. The Prophet is reading this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's being told, don't worry. Whatever they do to you, the end of it is what? You're going to be okay. And those that follow you, they're going to be okay too. But the ones that go against you, the ones that hurt the message of Islam, the ones that try to hurt the messenger or the believers, what are they going to have? Full consequence of their actions, right? So, a lesson point for us, the guy who came from the end of the city, our ulama said, was he a scholar? Did Allah say in the Quran, this guy was a scholar? Did he have a PhD in anything? Was he some kind of a, a sheikh? Was he a spiritual guru or a master? Like, what was his credentials? What do we know about this guy? Huh? Yes. Yes. All we know about him is he was a believer in Allah and he cared about people. That's it. He cared about them enough to travel long distance to come in and, and, and warn the people. And ended up getting killed. Now, the message here is, he could have said, there are three messengers calling people to Allah. Let them do their job. I am okay. Right? We have Adam Center. We have all these big masajid, big scholars ca calling people to Allah. <clears throat> Let them do their job. I, I'm, I'm not a big scholar. So I, I don't have to do these things. If you have that attitude, what's going to happen? It's not good, right? So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, even though there are messengers, the average person who believed in Allah came out to support the cause. Even though it looked like it was a losing cause, he came out to call the people to Allah. And so you don't say, oh, there are this person, Sheikh so-and-so is here, so-and-so is here, I'll let the masjid handle it, I'll let the scholars handle it. No, you also have to do something. Because this message is not just for the scholars, this message is for who? For everybody. Everybody's supposed to have compassion in their heart. Everybody's supposed to have rahmah in their heart. Everybody's supposed to care about one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, <clears throat> Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O people of iman, Hu anfuzukum wa ahlikum, Nar. Save yourself and your families from the hellfire. Now, does that mean Allah is talking to the father and the father has to save the mother and the children from the fire? It's not just the dad's job. Does that mean Allah is talking to the mother and telling the mother you have to save your husband and children from the fire? 
Is Allah only talking to the older sibling and saying you have to save your parents and your younger siblings from the fire? Who's Allah talking to? Everyone. Everyone in the family. Your job is to help your family to protect them from the fire. If you have younger siblings, older siblings, parents, children, grandchildren, in-laws, uh, neighbors, dog, whatever it is, you have to care about them. And you have to do your best to make sure they're on the straight path, you're on the straight path. And if everybody cares about each other in that way, what's going to happen? Not only is your whole family will be saved, people around you, your friends, your loved ones, they're going to be saved because of you. Right? They'll have shafa because of you. And the way we do this, our scholars said, is pray together. How many homes do we have jama'ah prayers together? How many homes we have we have Quran reading moments together? Like let's do every Thursday night, everyone get together and we we'll read something together from the Quran, either translation or something. Right? <coughs> you have to help one another. And when you do this, Allah brings his barakah, Allah brings his mercy, and you have good life. You have good life. And you can enjoy your phone and your PlayStation 4 and your PSP and your VR systems, whatever, right? It's okay. But but the fact that you're, you're remembering Allah together is enough to earn you Allah's mercy. Because last thing in Hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, My love is obligatory. It's been guaranteed to people who love one another for my sake. Who sit with one another and remember me for my sake. Who meet each other for my sake. So if you sit with other people to remember Allah, if you speak with other people to remember Allah, if you have routines set up with people to come pray together, make dhikr together, whatever, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, His love is there with you guys. And when Allah loves you, you don't need anything else. True or not? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So that's the conclusion of the story from Surah Yasin. <coughs> any questions, any comments, anything you want to add that I missed? Allah bless you. No questions? Shamir? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Let's make dua. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbul Alameen, we ask you to shower this gathering with your mercy, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin, we ask you to forgive our sins, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect all of us, Ya Allah, and all of our families, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin, you are the most merciful, the most kind, Ya Allah. We turn to you for forgiveness and mercy, Ya Allah. No one can forgive our sins except you, Ya Allah. And Ya Rabbul Alameen, we have no refuge except you, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin, we ask you to protect us like you protect your righteous servants, Ya Allah. And allow us to live a good life in this world, Ya Allah. And grant us actions that are pleasing to you, Ya Allah. Wherever we are, whatever we do, Ya Rabbul Alameen, surround us with people who will support us in our deen, Ya Allah. And we ask Ya Rabbul Alameen to protect us from the company of of wicked people, Ya Allah. Mm. Protect us from the company of people that have bad influences on us, Ya Allah. Mm. And protect us from the shayateen of ins and jinn, Ya Allah. Mm. We ask Ya Rabbul Alameen, anyone going through struggles in their lives, Ya Allah, grant us ease, Ya Allah. Grant us ease, Ya Allah, and grant us strength to face the challenges, Ya Allah. Mm. Anyone going through hardships in their health, grant us shifa, Ya Allah. Mm. Anyone going through hardship in their financial affairs, Provide for us halal and tayyib risk, Ya Allah. Mm -hmm. And don't make us depend on anyone other than you, Ya Allah. Mm -hmm. Ya Rabbul Alameen, we ask you to guide us in every decision that we make, Ya Allah. Mm -hmm. And be pleased with us and make us amongst those who are beloved to you, Ya Allah. Mm -hmm. And we ask you, Ya Rahman Rahimin, make us a beacon of light, Ya Allah. A source of guidance for others, Ya Allah. And guide us and guide many people through us, Ya Allah. And we ask Ya Rabbul Alameen to choose us amongst those who you have elected and selected. And we ask you to make us amongst your awliya, muttaqeen al muqarrabin Ya Allah. We ask Ya Rabbul Alameen to unite us on the day of judgment under the shade of your throne in the company of the prophets and the siddiqeen, Ya Allah. And grant us a drink from the hands of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and keep us in his company, Ya Allah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa akhirat da'wana. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Amin. Amin. Jazakallah khair.